So today we will talk about the paper uh, uh, in, introducing the algorithm uh, Mu0. The, the title is uh, Mastering Atari, Go, Chess and uh, Shogi by planning with the LEM model. Yeah, uh, so it's a paper by uh, it's, uh, the series by uh, Google DeepMind. Uh, so uh, like, I, I'm guessing that most of you know that uh, uh, DeepMind made a, a lot of uh, splash news uh, because of uh, the, the, its successes at these different games. Uh, so it, it started with Atari uh, initially, the, the Atari games in, I think, 2013, 12, maybe, something like this. And uh, so the Atari games are like arcade games, and uh, the, the AI was uh, learning uh, by using the raw inputs from, from the screen, uh, which was very impressive. Um, and, and then it, it learned and it eventually reached a superhuman uh, level at uh, some games and not at others. Uh, we'll, be, we'll discuss this uh, mm -hmm. later on. And then there was these uh, breakthroughs in, uh, in Go, especially, and uh, AlphaGo in particular, uh, who, with this famous game uh, with uh, Lissidol in 2016. And then afterwards, uh, there were uh, AlphaGo Zero, uh, which was, uh, as opposed to AlphaGo, who started with a lot of uh, data from uh, masters, uh, human masters, uh, at the game uh, of Go. Uh, AlphaGo Zero started with, uh, from scratch. And then there was Alpha Zero, uh, who uh, not only started from, from, from scratch, but also had a general enough uh, framework so that it could uh, solve both, uh, play both uh, Go, Chess, and uh, Shogi, yeah. uh, three, uh, three different uh, games or strategy games, like, uh, very similar. Uh, but uh, now the Mu0 is like the, the latest uh, breakthrough of, uh, of DeepMind, which is uh, an algorithm that's able to play the four games all at once. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Atari is actually not only four games. Yeah, yeah it. actually it's more than yeah. four. And yeah. uh, what's a bit surprising is also that uh, somehow Shogi, Go and Chess, they are very similar, but they are very different from Atari games. The fact that it's the same algorithms that can play well for Go, Shogi, etc., and for Atari games, of course, is quite surprising. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I, I, I think uh, so. I read this uh, a few months ago, but I think I was quite surprised by the fact that you could like, they manage this because the models seem quite different. So uh, that's the basic difference between so-called uh, model-based reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm and uh, model-free uh, reinforcement learning. So in the case of Go, Chess, and Shogi, uh, the, the classical models had a lot of structures uh, because the, the algorithm knew ahead of time the, the, the rules of the game. And this is important because it allows to construct the so-called uh, tree of, uh, of the search tree. Yeah. Uh, and then you can explore it using Monte Carlo uh, methods. Uh, which is much harder to do if you are in a model-free uh, uh, environment where you don't have a prior model of, of, of the game. Yes, so in that case, uh, so yeah, I, 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 actually model-free, it would be also some models that sometimes don't even try to, to learn a model of the environment. Yeah. But uh, here, the case of, uh, of Mu0, it's still a model-based approach, but trying to, to learn yeah. what is the model of the world. And so the way it works is that the the neural network that, uh, that is used to, to predict the future reward and predict the, the policies what move to do, it also has an internal state that, he, that has the role of representing the environment and also in a way that uh, it, this internal state will predict for, for possible actions taken how this internal state will change. And somehow it, it's not an exact representation of the, of the future of the environment given certain actions, but it's uh, what information is most useful to correctly predict the future reward. Mm -hmm. And as the mu0 algorithm is trained, uh, this representation is uh, more and more useful and, uh, yeah. and allows to... So after this, they do the, still do Monte Carlo research, but applying to this uh, uh, hidden latent state in the, in the neural network. Yeah. Um... So, so maybe we can go back a little bit and explain a bit the, the basics of reinforcement learning. Uh, maybe there are some viewers who, who are discovering the, these words. <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it's true. Uh, reinforcement learning is uh, very interesting because it's a very general framework. Uh, so the very general framework of reinforcement learning is that you have this algorithm 
and the algorithm uh, is interacting with some environment by receiving inputs from the environment, uh, which typically when you're playing uh, games would be either the screen of the game or the, the, the well, how the, the plateau of the game is, uh, is like. Yeah. Uh, and also it's going to be receiving uh, every now, well, sometimes, a reward um, that can be uh, plus one or zero or minus one or, or different things. And typically in the game of, of, uh, of Go or Chess or Shogi, uh, this will be a plus one if, if the, like when the, or if rather the, the, the algorithm wins a game and minus one uh, if it loses the game. Uh, but uh, what makes these games hard is that most of the time you don't receive any rewards and the same also for, for Atari games. Um, and, and, but yeah, more generally, uh, you, you're, you're, but yeah, more generally, you have this framework where you have you have this interaction. The algorithm is is making some actions, so it's it's, it's saying things essentially. So typically, in the game of of, uh, of Go, it would be saying, "Oh, I'll put a pebble on this uh, position," uh, and it then receives uh, observations from what the plateau is like, or and uh, potentially rewards uh, at at any given time. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, very interesting because it uh, is a very general framework in the sense that you can think that what we humans are doing in a sense is quite similar to this. Like we have all of these sensory uh, input from our eyes, from our nose uh, and so on uh, at every instant. Uh, we, are, we also have some reward, like sometimes we feel, we feel happy, uh, sometimes we feel sad, uh, sometimes we feel angry, sometimes we, and so on. And, uh, and then based on this, we have some mechanism, some decision making mechanism, uh, mostly in our brain, uh, that uh, pushes us to do, to undertake some action. Mm -hmm. and, and what's interesting is that uh, uh, the way you, you can think of ourselves doing, even though we're not always doing it perfectly, is that the way we're going to choose the action is usually so that we can maximize some kind of rewards we're going to get uh, in our brains, and that's the same for for the algorithms. They 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 try to find patterns in the way the rewards are given. Um, and typically, if they observe that whenever they do this, they get a reward, then they will learn that this kind of action uh, is the right is the the kind of action that gives them rewards. So mm -hmm. they will repeat it uh, more likely. Yeah, and they will also uh, in the case of reinforcement learning. Also, we can expect algorithms will. Uh try to reach states in which there, there is more reward to gain. Yeah. So, I don't know, for, for, for chess, for example, there are state of the game that even though they are far from a, from a victory, they, they are much closer to, to a victory. And, and this is what a uh, reinforcement learning algorithm will learn. And it's the same thing as for us humans. We, even though most, most of the time we would take decisions that make us happy on the moment, like uh, eating right now is important for me because I will feel good, it's time for lunch. But a lot of the decisions I take are also pushed forward to the future. And I'm, I'm doing this right now because I know it will uh, lead rewards for far future. And this is the problem of reinforcement learning. Yeah. Yeah. And so in the, in the approach of, the, of New Zero, but uh, very commonly in most of reinforcement learning, you have uh, different key objects. Like one of them is the is the value value function so the mm -hmm. uh, sometimes called the well the value function is like uh, if I'm at these given states then what's the expected rewards I will get later on if I keep playing as I'm playing something like this yeah. uh, so that's the, the value function if you know this this is critical in chess or like in, in board games because uh, you don't get the reward immediately so you whenever you play you just uh, try to imagine how the future states of the game will be, but it's not going to be the, the final state because you cannot compute all, all the way till the end. Yeah, yeah, so one action would have a high value, either if it gives you high reward right now, or if it brings you to state of the world where it will lead higher reward later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then there's uh, another the important object, which is the policy function. So the policy uh, function is uh, telling the agent what it's going to be doing uh, at uh, any given stage of the game. And uh, like you might think that at first that it's a bit stupid because it knows what it's going to be doing. You could imagine this. But uh, the, 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 a lot of the problems have, have to do with approximations because you can only know an approximation of what you're going to, to do next. 
partly because what you're going to be doing uh, next, uh, the next stage of the game, uh, will be, uh, depending on new computations you'll be doing at this stage of the game, maybe you spend more computational power at this point and explore more branches of the tree, typically. Mm -hmm. And so what you plan right now and what you're going to plan later on is only an approximation of what you're going, actually going to do uh, later on, which is, uh, I think, interesting to, to, uh, to think about and uh, also, also a key uh, aspect of, of Mu0 in particular, because what Mu0 is doing is that it's always trying to predict what it's going to do later on. Yeah. And there's uh, actually a loss function. So uh, uh, at any given stage, like if it predicts badly, then it gets, uh, well, it's going to change its parameters so that it, get, it gets to better predictions uh, later on. Um, and then uh, a third important object of, uh, of uh, at least mu0 and uh, most of reinforcement learning is uh, a, a state uh, usually a vector representation, something like this, of, of, uh, of the state. So, and uh, this is trying to capture everything that's relevant, uh, at least in the case of mu0, everything that's relevant to do all the other computations. So you can think of the, the, st the, the, the state of, of mu0 as a compression of all the information that mu0 has received uh, in the past that's trying to describe how, how, how the, the game is like. Yeah, and I think it's more, than a, it's more than just a state of the world, a representation of the state of the world, but also a, a, a model that describes how the world evolves when you take actions. Yeah. Because uh, it uses this to, to predict, uh, if I follow this policy, what are my uh, expected rewards in the future? And that's a... So it, it not only needs to know the state of the world right now, but what would be the state of the world given a sequences of action that, yeah. that it will take. Yeah, yeah. So, so somehow in this state is also sort of encoded also like somehow also its future actions and how they're going to impact. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and the, the key aspect of the learning part of all of it is how do you compute these different objects? Uh, uh, so typically, uh, like for instance, the, the, the state uh, is going to be computed based on observations that you make and rewards that you receive. And uh, so there's a function that's going to transform observations into a state uh, of, of mu0. And this function is going to be a neural network, uh, typically. And it's going to be parameterized by the weights of the neural network. And you want to learn the right parameters so that you, you get to a good state representation. And then there's another function that takes the, the, the state and then computes uh, the action to be taken for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, this function has parameters and you want to optimize them. And you want to optimize actually all the way, uh, everything all the way. And so you have all these parameters that you're going to learn uh, based on, uh, well, typically how well your prediction is close to uh, what you end up playing, things like this, what your estimations of the future rewards you're going to receive uh, are close to the actual rewards you actually received, and so on. Um, yeah, and so that, that's a very, uh, that's a very, in the end, um, it's like it, it may seem a bit complicated, there's a lot of objects, but like in the end it's like just basic uh, tools that are just combined together. Um, and uh, I guess what's surprising is, is that it works uh, that well. <laughs> um, like for, for a long time there seemed to be a gap, to, and it's often said like uh, clearly uh, the game of Go, the game of chess, or or the game of, of Shogi, or like very specific uh, uh, settings uh, for reinforcement learning. It's like not the, the general reinforcement learning that you want to be doing, for instance, for self-driving cars or, or for mm -hmm. recommender systems. Uh, but like this paper shows that uh, like for environment more complex already, like the Atari games, where you don't have a clear model of, of uh, what the game is like, then you actually make a lot of progress uh, using this kind of learning. And uh, well, I guess uh, a question is like, <laughs> how far can you go uh, along this way? Yeah. yeah so the, definitely the the way this model is able to generalize to to more types of game, it uh, it, it makes us think uh, what what else can it generalize to, and uh, does it generalize to uh, perfectly recommending the videos on a, on a recommender system? Yeah. For for getting you to engage uh, at most possible with the platform. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's 
Yeah, maybe before getting into this, we can discuss uh, the, the limits uh, of, of the game, of the of mu zero, of yeah, the, sure. the reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, because it performs uh, superhuman at many, many games. But weirdly enough, it's, uh, I don't know if it's weird, but it actually fails to do uh, human level performance at, at some games. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't remember all the games, but uh, one of them is Montezuma. <laughs> yeah, I think called Montezuma Revenge. If I understand the game uh, well, it's, you need to navigate through a kind of maze, which also has a lot of, uh, of uh, devices to, to, to trick the player and uh, that are dangerous to avoid in the environment. And you need to go in such part of, of the maze pick up a key, go in another part of the maze, open the door with the key you have collected and, uh, and find your way through, uh, through this complex thing. And uh, I, I think I understood yesterday from our discussion that the reason why this mu zero does not uh, correctly learn uh, to solve this game is that it, there's too, many, uh, too much distance between picking up a key at some corner of the maze and going to the other corner to open the door. And so it's actually it, it, because before, before solving the game one time and observing the first reward, it actually has uh, too many uh, possibilities of uh, move, moves to make. So before it can actually have uh, any training signal from the, from the game environment, it, doesn't, uh, it, 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 it can't solve it. Like they, yeah. yeah, it's very, like I'm guessing that there's a lot of iteration where after maybe uh, hundreds, thousands, even maybe millions of iterations, it still has no cool. any no, no positive reward. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can imagine like uh, an algorithm that never receives any good re any reward, like it just does not know what is good and what is bad. Well, I guess it knows that you shouldn't die, <laughs> yeah. but it does not know how to progress in the game. Uh, and, and that may be uh, one of the reasons why it performs so poorly. Yeah, and the reason why uh, humans are so good at this game is because when we've see the game for the first time first of all we we realize it's a kind of maze and we will need to keep in memory what is the structure of the of the environment in which we are moving and uh, we, we need to come back at some at some point when we see a door we we know and we keep in memory that oh i remember there there is a door here i will need to come back there at some point and when we see something that has the, the shape of a key we also ra very rapidly learn that oh this is the key to go open the door and we can do it right away. So somehow it comes from our, our common sense that we, that we knew how to, uh, how to solve this. And it's not something you can learn just by interacting with the game. It's something when humans play this game, they, they know it because they, they have been living in the, in the world for a long time and the game is somehow imitation of the, of the world we live in. So yeah, we discussed that to solve this, uh, an algorithms would maybe need a, some uh, module that uh, allows to have a longer memory, like in a LSTM, to to remember key points of the environment with which it will need to interact in the future, but also uh, common sense uh, things. Like yeah. If I see uh, something shaped like a door, I need to look for something shaped like a key. And uh, for example, you mentioned that maybe uh, something like uh, what GPT-2 is learning could uh, could 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 provide this sort of logics to yeah. to be used. Yeah. Yeah. So like uh, on second on second thought, like I'm not sure like the the memory part is necessarily that big of a problem mm -hmm. because uh, the way Museo is set up, like it has this uh, this state where it can encode a, a very long term memory. Yeah. So um, I, I I I feel like the problem is more with not not having a lot of rewards and if. Any, like, uh, that can be very much of a problem. Whereas I think if a uh, human plays the game, uh, whenever it, it gets a key, uh, it, it will update, like it will receive a, 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 an inner reward, like uh, yeah. some, something like this. And it will at least think that this is this has a, probably a, an important priority to be much more beneficial, like much more positive than uh, than just running and <laughs> doing nothing uh, on the screen. Um, and I would guess that if you have these sort of local uh, inputs and say, yeah, that, that's good, like you just have this teacher that says, yeah, you did something good here, yeah. um, and give you a bit of reward, uh, then maybe uh, Museo would get quickly good at, uh, at uh, Montezuma's. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, revenge. Um, yeah, and uh, what's interesting is uh, if you think about why we humans, when we're playing these games, uh, whenever we get a key, we get a bit excited, like we <laughs> feel like we've made some progress. Exactly. Yeah. It's because like we, we, we well, all games are like this, like uh, we, whenever we play a game, and I guess uh, whenever we, like we, our parents or our brothers or, or whatever, like our surrounding, like uh, encouraged us when we did this little thing and and also, like, there's a, a whole code with the, the way uh, games are set up. There's a, like we said, like there, there's a lot of uh, of things that have become learned by by uh, video game players. Like, for instance, if you hit something and then the the character is uh, is blinking, blinking on on the screen, probably it's not good. <laughs> but how do you know this? Well, because yeah, in most games, that's how, what uh, happens. And maybe uh, if. Um, uh, typically, the algorithm that uh, uh, MuZero had played other games uh, where you had more uh, immediate feedbacks. Maybe if it started with Mario <laughs> or something mm -hmm. like this, where the, the game is simpler, I guess, uh, then it can learn some, the, the value function can learn that, uh, well, if you get this, then the, the expected future reward is going to be slightly larger because you, you got the key. Uh, or, or like in Mario, maybe you get a, a star or whatever. Uh, then maybe you can use this in Montezuma to say, yeah, I should search for keys. Uh, and yeah, it will accelerate. It's so really... if, the, if uh, collecting a key is encoded in the state of the game, in the, in the, in the environment model, then isn't it uh, already part of the model that it will uh, realize that uh, having this encoded leads to more higher expected rewards? Uh, yeah, yeah, but it will have learned this by playing another another video game. And, oh yeah, and, all right. Um, yeah, I'm guessing that's what happens for humans. Like uh, every game we play, video game we play, makes us better for a lot of different video games. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but but we also dis we also discussed yesterday the fact that uh, well, when we see a door and a key, like we humans tend to think that. Uh, Maybe the key is useful to open the door. <laughs> uh, and this is a common knowledge, common sense that we have because, uh, well, we open doors every day, at least uh, I use my keys uh, every day. Uh, and so it's like, yeah, we have a lot of data about this. Uh, whereas uh, Museo had no data about this, so it was much harder for it uh, to know about this. And um, and yeah, maybe if you want a, a, a reinforcement learning algorithm that's good and that quickly learns uh, to play well at a lot of uh, games, maybe it will need also to have so, uh, such uh, uh, common knowledge. And it's even more important for something like uh, YouTube. Uh, if it wants to recommend uh, robustly beneficial videos, it needs to understand what makes a video uh, robustly beneficial, what can uh, what are the signals that it's not getting directly, but it could infer from uh, like, uh, the equivalent of, mm -hmm. of getting a key, like uh, maybe uh, the, the user, uh, I, I, I don't know what a good user does uh, when he watching a, a very good videos, maybe he comments and uh, maybe he goes on Wikipedia. I don't know if there's a way for YouTube to know that the user has gone just afterwards on, on Wikipedia. If you use uh, Google Chrome, I, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, if you use Google Chrome, yeah. Uh, so yeah, maybe uh, this, it's a sign that there's something positive uh, about uh, the video, but maybe uh, this has to be learned in some way. Mm -hmm. And we talked about transformers because uh, transformers are, are are interesting because they so transformers uh, and especially uh, GPT two are these so transformers have been invented uh, uh, I think by Google uh, in 2017 something like this, and uh, they um, um, they are a model to do natural language processing. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, like if I explain this roughly, what they trying to do when they read a sentence, when, when a transformer reads a sentence, it tries to find the words that combine well together uh, to, to give meaning to the words. Uh, if you think about it, like there are many homonyms uh, in English or in any language. And the way we uh, understand the different words is by understanding the context in which they are used. And that's sort of what uh, transformers are trying to to. to to, to identify and also what's nice is that you can learn to identify, to have better uh, grouping of the, the, the different uh, words in a sentence. Uh, anyways, uh, so this, this is a very successful model for natural language processing. Probably should do something about transformers at some point in this uh, 
uh, in this series. Uh, but what's nice is that uh, GPT-2 in particular, which was uh, designed by OpenAI, was uh, able to then uh, give speeches. Like you can start a sentence and there's actually a website called talktotransformer.com where you can write a first sentence and ask uh, GPT-2 to complete. And it, what's very uh, fascinating is that it's doing quite a, a good job, not human level, but it's quite a nice job at at completing things, and the way it completes uh, the text reveals the fact that it has some uh, knowledge representation inside it. Uh, so we actually did the test uh, yesterday, like we asked uh, GPT-2 uh, what are keys good for? <laughs> it was funny because the answer was... Uh, decrypt. Well, <laughs> <laughs> keys are very good to decrypt and crypt, uh, de <laughs> cryptography and stuff, so, uh, which is uh, a bias, I guess, uh, I guess uh, the, the data, you know, so, uh, I guess GPT-2 was mostly based on Wikipedia and uh, mm -hmm. I guess on Wikipedia, uh, keys uh, are mostly <laughs> related to cryptography <laughs> and very basic things about keys, like keys open doors, <laughs> are not that uh, common on, uh, mm -hmm. on Wikipedia. <laughs> so so that's interesting also because it shows that you, you also need some prior knowledge probably to really understand Wikipedia or to, at least there's some information that we have that's, that's missing yeah that's yeah. missing or that's hard to find on wikipedia because it's so obvious that it's not written on wikipedia <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, th yeah, like th this uh, represents to me like a uh, research questions which i've thought about uh, lately but uh, it's really not my field so uh, it would be very hard for me to make any contribution and I th also I, th I think it's very experimental and i'm more of a theorist but it, it's like Trying to understand like what what is the information uh, encoded in, in uh, transformers? Can we use it? Is it safe to use it? Uh, like probably there's going to be a lot of biases, uh, like a huge amount of biases in, in transformers. Uh, like how do you extract the the information that is uh, uh, reliable out of a transformer? Uh, mm -hmm. And can you use it for like? To be plugged in some uh, reinforcement learning algorithm for video recommendation, for instance. Um, like, like, as of today, I would say, just don't do it. <laughs> like, don't plug it, uh, <laughs> plug and play. I, think yeah, I didn't hear any, uh, any gender biases related to GPT-2. But like, for, for, for example, for where to vec, we right away heard about uh, doctor minus yeah. man plus woman equals nurse. And this was a uh, quite problematic yeah. in terms of gender bias, but I didn't hear that for GPT-2. Uh, yeah, I didn't hear it for GPT-2, but I, I didn't mean like gender, gender biases uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. I just mean biases like uh, if you ask a GPT-2 uh, what are keys good for. Yeah, so yeah. Arguably, it's, mm -hmm. it's a bias. Like, it's, not what the, it's not the answer you would expect uh, if you were talking for human, to a human mm -hmm. at least. Uh, and maybe there are other problems that are, other things that are more problematic than this. But also, like there are things like, um, like for instance, if I ask you to, to sum up uh, in one sentence, uh, what do we know, like about, uh, 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 or I guess in one sentence, you have to answer the question, like in one short sentence, you have to answer the question, is nuclear energy uh, good? Or is nuclear energy safe? Uh, or should you nuclear energy be used? Like whatever sentence you come up with, if, if it's very short, <laughs> Um, it's going to be a very biased... Uh, Except uh, it depends. <laughs> yeah, it's, or it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be... You have to, because it's only one sentence, you have to give a very uh, biased, or at least very simplified uh, version of all the complexity behind uh, nuclear energy. And, uh, and the way you go, the, the, it can be easily biased, uh, yeah, like if I ask you, uh, are, are vaccines 100% safe? Well, I, I'm not sure I wouldn't want to answer this question. Like, <laughs> and you have one bit of information. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so yeah, th that's why like uh, information that's in the, the form of, of language, like, I think it's very, very hard to make it uh, robustly beneficial and uh, robustly reliable. Uh, I, I think it's an interesting challenge. Uh, and eventually, if you want uh, algorithms to have a lot of, uh, of good, of common sense priors, I'd say. And I think at some point it's going to be 
important if you want to make uh, YouTube robustly beneficial, you need to understand uh, a lot of the context uh, that humans live uh, in. Uh, I, I think uh, based, something based on natural language processing, which is, by the way, the way we do, like the way we have a, a world model, uh, at least academics like us, <laughs> uh, is mostly by reading stuff. So. Mm -hmm. and maybe seeing a few graphs, but reading is uh, by far, I think, the, the most uh, informative uh, medium. Uh, yeah, I think I, maybe for, for complex things, but for the, the simple common sense, I, I guess we learn it as a as baby experimenting with the world. Like, I'm yeah, sure you maybe. didn't learn that a key opened a door just by reading it, or even not really by listening to someone. You learn it by because you... You've used it, uh, so, I guess. I don't. So, so it depends which door. Like this door back here, yeah. But uh, cryptography uh, doors. Yeah. Okay. The fact. Yeah. <laughs> this I read. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. I, I guess it depends on a lot of information. Uh, but like, I guess for an algorithm, like it's not clear what is the best way. Like I, I guess another way to to learn a lot about the. the the the, uh, the common sense of uh, like humans common sense uh, for for algorithms would be to to watch videos or have uh, images uh, but you have the same problem then like uh, how do you infer reliable uh, knowledge about the world from such data like, uh, yeah, like I feel like it's a, a bit of an overwhelming question <laughs> like, I haven't thought about it enough I guess but uh, it sounds very, very hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so another thing we discussed uh, yesterday is uh, the distinction between uh, reinforcement learning and supervised learning. Um, the, there's a, so supervised learning is like this, um, um, where, where you have, you, typically you're trying to predict if there's a cat in the image and you have a lot of, image, of images, some of them have cats, and you're told that, that these are images of cats, and there's a lot of images where there's no cats. And then you use these labels like, to, to, to eventually learn what are images of cats. Um, and uh, by, by far, most of uh, machine learning these days are, is like, uh, like by, by far, 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 it's like supervised learning, uh, mm -hmm. especially what's de deployed. Uh, but this has led to a lot of, uh, of debates because, uh, especially in like, the effective altruism uh, movement, like uh, there's a lot of, of discussion about like very powerful uh, algorithms, uh, and it's typically framed in terms of reinforcement learning. And there, there, there tends to be a lot of division between uh, these two frameworks, reinforcement learning and supervised uh, learning. Uh, and I guess one question is like, do they pose the same? Uh, uh, problems in terms of safety and ethics. Um, I guess that would that'd be a, a, an important question for, for us. Like, uh, uh, is it like when we're working for supervised learning, are we also work uh, for the safety of, of supervised learning? Are we also really making an important contribution to uh, the future algorithms that are going to be using reinforcement learning? Mm -hmm. um, uh, like I feel that uh, for many problems we got related to supervised learning, the answer is yes. Uh, there's a lot to be learned from supervised learning. And uh, I think this paper was also interesting in that it really shows this, I think, uh, because uh, in the end the components used to do reinforcement learning, uh, learning policies, learning uh, the value function, uh, and learning the, the predictions of future rewards, all of these functions are, are learned using supervised learning in the end. They are learned using supervised learning, but the, the data generated to train them has been uh, generated using uh, uh, Monte Carlo tree search algorithms. Yeah, so, so, so it's not the entire part of it, mm -hmm. um, but uh, th these are key po components of, of the algorithm. Uh, and uh, like if you can make su supervised learning uh, more robust, uh, safer, and so on, you're also making new zero more robust and, and safer. Mm -hmm. Well, Museo is not very dangerous because it's only playing games, uh, like uh, games uh, not on the internet, <laughs> uh, so it's really safe. But uh, if you transpose it to, to YouTube, uh, I think the YouTube algorithm is doing a huge amount of supervised learning. Yeah, but yeah, about this we we discussed uh, some time ago that uh, actually 
we were quite worried that the YouTube algorithms would be doing reinforcement learning. It's worrying because if it's doing reinforcement learning, it means that uh, the difference between reinforcement and, uh, and very simple supervised learning is that the reinforcement learning algorithms will try to reach states in which it gains more reward. And for a YouTube recommender system, reaching a, a state in which it gets more reward, it means changing the user, transforming mm. the user into a user that is more addicted to YouTube, spends more time on YouTube. Yeah. So this is quite worrisome that there, there would be this uh, very powerful algorithm that's spending all of its energy into changing the users into uh, YouTube addicts. Yeah. So, but in the end of this discussion, we, we concluded that mostly the algorithms at, at the moment use, use mostly uh, supervised learning. But then, uh, then from yesterday's discussion, we also see that there is not such a clear-cut distinction between uh, supervised and unsupervised, for example. A supervised learning algorithms that would measure its uh, its uh, its reward based on the next two weeks of collected data and continuously be trained over time, then this one would sort of have the very similar behavior as if it was a reinforcement learning algorithm uh, yeah. running behind. Yeah, yeah, and uh, as a anecdote, I guess, but uh, so. For my YouTube channel, like I have a YouTube advisor uh, from, from YouTube uh, to grow my channel and something like this. And uh, I've been given a lot of advice to make the channel more popular, something like this. And one thing I was told uh, again and again is that uh, uh, what I should do is like videos not only that uh, people are going to click on and be watching until the end, but also that will make people stay on the platform on YouTube longer and even come back the next day or the next two days. So my, my, for based on this, like what I inferred with, uh, with uh, some uh, important probability is that uh, the YouTube algorithm is already doing, already doing this, like uh, using like the, like trying to predict at least every, every, every now, every point of time, uh, how users are going to use uh, YouTube in the next two days, something like this. And then use this data to, to, to improve the predictions mm -hmm. of the algorithm. Um, and so I guess when it's only two days, you, I think you already observe uh, some, some, some addictive be behavior, uh, addictive enhancement strategies uh, that, uh, that are deployed by the algorithm. Uh, but I guess this is only two days, but uh, I, I guess they, they will try to expand this uh, time horizon more and more. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, that's what uh, Craig Boutillet, who came, uh, who's working at Google uh, AI, uh, and uh, proposed also, like he he came to APFL. He gave a talk where he, he talked about a, 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 a more reinforcement learning algorithm for the video recommendation, and he was talking about time frames that were more in terms of of months, mm -hmm. at least weeks, but even months. And uh, I guess the more planning there is, like, especially the more uh, the planning is uh, performant, uh, the, the more important it is that, uh, but the more like the algorithm is going to be powerful in what it's doing, and the more urgent it will be to make sure that uh, the algorithm is aligned, uh, that it's doing some planning that's uh, in accordance with what we, with, we would want it to be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the thing stopping uh, reinforcement learning at the moment for, for this recommended algorithm is that the state of actions to be taken is extremely large. There is more than, uh, more than millions of videos to recommend for its users. And also the, the data we collect from users is very different than the data you collect from uh, playing an Atari game because the Atari game is extremely uh, easy to predict. Yeah. It's very predictable compared to users that uh, don't pay attention to, to everything they see on the screen and uh, even though they would see everything they would not click uh, always at the same place uh, yeah so. yeah there's a there's a lot of, of noise uh, and even some well you have these curves where you can see uh, like how much people click uh, like on, on per video something like this uh, per recommended video and th these things uh, like fluctuate over time but it can be a trend mm -hmm. uh, but you have to remove uh, the noise, uh, which is uh, very hard and uh, makes uh, the learning of the algorithm uh, much slower. Like it's much harder to learn when you don't have clear signals uh, 
Mm -hmm. You can imagine doing your PhD and your supervisor say, like on one day say, ah, and then <laughs> they say, oh, it's awesome. <laughs> and they say, oh, actually, no. <laughs> Well, it's better to have clear signals to, for, for learning, and that's not what uh, the YouTube algorithm is receiving. Yeah, so, yeah, so how do you see the future of uh, reinforcement learning? Uh, yeah, so what I expect is that we, we asked this question yesterday of uh, when will uh, Montezuma revenge be beaten by algorithms, and uh, then, as we also discussed, uh, the several ways in, in, to, to do it. I expect that we will be uh, quite surprised and uh, of when it will come. Similarly to the way people were surprised that Go was beaten much uh, sooner than uh, that expert would uh, was were expecting. Yeah, yeah. The, like the, the the history of reinforcement learning, I, I think for for well, it's like a bit the the history of uh, of AI as well. Like it has been winters and <laughs> and periods of excitement and. Um, and over the last decade, uh, I think there has been, well, uh, it's quite unarguably a lot of spectacular breakthroughs uh, in reinforcement learning. Uh, things that, like, especially AlphaGo, like nobody was expecting uh, AlphaGo when it, it came up. Uh, and people were predicting like it would take decades uh, to, to, to beat humans at, at the game of Go. Um, so, this is a reason to to be uh, um, well to, to expect a lot of uh, of, uh, of new breakthroughs. But on the other hand, I think there's a um, like we there has not been that many real world application of uh, reinforcement learning so far. Uh, so it's still questionable. Like how how fast can we are we going to move from uh, from these. Uh, game playing uh, algorithms to things that are actually deployed uh, and uh, like we talked also about uh, self-driving cars in the previous yeah. podcast like um, the more I think about self-driving cars the, the less I, I'm excited about this <laughs> uh, and I, I'm not sure I would be really excited about reinforcement learning being used for the so is, to become is reinforcement system. learning really uh, crucial for self-driving car because uh, they so yeah, I think again you can break down the primary because, like, I, I, I see reinforcement learning more as a framework than as an algorithm. Like, it's not clear what a reinforcement mm -hmm. learning algorithm is, but it's pretty clear what the reinforcement learning framework is. Yeah, okay. And arguably, the, the self driving car is in the reinforcement learning framework, as is the YouTube algorithm, as is uh, each and every one of us. So, but somehow, when you say reinforcement learning, I see some, uh, some algorithms that will learn and get better over time. And I really hope that for self-driving car, they will be uh, deployed only once they are yeah. at the at the best uh, with the best model possible, and not really. I, I would not feel confident that you tell me out there there are cars that will get better by the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another discussion we had uh, between like continuous learning and uh, I, I guess what most people do these days is like they more like they train their mo their model, they, they run some tests, the algorithm seems good. It's deployed, but it stops learning once it's <laughs> deployed. Um, I, I, well, th there's one problem with this is uh, the prime of uh, evasion attacks, uh, because yeah. if the, the, prime, the, the algorithm has a vulnerability, then it can be exploited uh, indefinitely uh, when it's online. Uh, yeah, and people will definitely try. Like, uh, for any recommender system, there are people that are working the hardest they can to be recommended as much as yeah. possible. And so if they are they call uh, YouTubers there. Yeah. <laughs> Every YouTuber. <laughs> if there is any possibility to somehow beat the algorithms that and uh, get get to be recommended uh, no matter what, then people will do it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, this this approach of uh, of uh, uh, how, how, like interrupted learning. I don't know how to call it. Like uh, algorithm that stops learning when they're deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not perfect. Uh, far from it. But I still feel it's safer. Uh, given what we know today, uh, especially uh, about poisoning attacks, then a, what I would call a continuous learning algorithm, an algorithm, even if it's doing supervised learning, but uh, it just keeps doing supervised learning with the user's inputs, typically. Uh, I think this is very dangerous, actually, because mm -hmm. of poisoning attacks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe it's a way to, to fight uh, evasion attacks, but, um, yeah, I'm not very hot on, on these algorithms being deployed. I think it's very important to 
So to keep in mind that these algorithms uh, that keep learning, they, they will change over time. And they may have passed tests in the past. This does not mean that in the future uh, they will pass the test again if they were exposed to a test. So, um, yeah, I think it's... Um, yeah, I'm leaning towards a lot, of, a lot more safety. <laughs> uh, and, mm -hmm. and let's not rush the deployment of these algorithms, <laughs> I would say. Okay, unfortunately, it's uh, not uh, our, our choice to yeah. make right now. And uh, yeah, when you ask me what I expect for the future, so first of all, better techniques that will allow to beat uh, more difficult uh, games really requiring some common sense like Montezuma. But also, I would expect that uh, maybe within five, 10 years, uh, most recommended system will also uh, get better at doing a reinforcement learning. So pushing even uh, further the boundary of how far in the future the algorithm is predicting it will it will have impact on the users to increase its uh, reward function. So yeah, I'm quite confident that this will be uh, yeah deployed yeah. already. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing like algorithms are going to gain more and more. Uh, I think these days the limits or the, the frontier is like very. Uh, uh, better world model and better uh, and, and better planning capabilities uh, and yeah I think they, they're going to gain more and more of this um, and that's I guess a, a good aspect but uh, yeah <laughs> it, if they can be robust as well that, that, that'd be good <laughs> and beneficial <laughs> and beneficial yeah, yeah. Cool. cool thanks so I hope you've enjoyed this video and I uh, hope we'll see you uh, next time. Next time we're going to discuss uh, a paper I wrote uh, yeah. called uh, a roadmap for a robust end-to-end -end alignment, um, which I, I think is a good paper, but I'm a bit biased. <laughs>